everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Barker, and we are the lucky few <laughs> that are through with volume one of Le Miserable, and um, definitely into volume two. I didn't want to wait much longer to do the volume one Zoom because we are getting close to the end of volume two, which is amazing. So we have gotten through the masterful um, essay on the Battle of Waterloo, which is at the very beginning of volume two. And we are just about done with the parentheses on convent life in volume two, uh, which I find absolutely amazing. I mean, do you see how Victor Hugo is having so much fun at our expense? He actually entitles, entitles his essays, the parentheses. So. Uh, read it if you must, and if you read it, you will be so much wiser. You will be almost as wise as the author of this book. He's, uh, he's definitely having fun at our expense. But this is definitely a volume one meeting, and as I mentioned in my uh, preliminary intro, we are in the middle of the Iowa City Book Festival. So um, this is a, a busy, busy time, and um, so far, I've hosted the screening of the 1958 um, Le Miserable film with Jean Gabin playing um, Jean Valjean. <laughs> and those of you who are not in Iowa City, please uh, find that film somewhere online. It, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And the amazing thing about that film was it was made in the late 50s, and it was um, French reaction to American blockbusters like the Ten Commandments. So the French felt that uh, we, need to, we need to beat those Americans at their own game. They're making all of these incredibly loud um, and enormous um, blockbusters. And uh, we can make a blockbuster to beat their blockbusters. And it's by comparison to something like uh, the Ten Commandments, it's a very subdued blockbuster, but it definitely covers the entirety of the Miserable. Um, and then um, I did a talk on all of my tutorials on Friday during the book festival. So tonight, I've been like running around the house collecting all of the things that I need to take to Riverside Theater tonight because um, we are doing a Le Mis in concert. So um, um, a, um, a baritone and a soprano will sing um, about 10, 10, 12 um, songs from, um, from Le Mis. Uh, we will have uh, Marius, Empty Chairs and Empty Tables, Stars of Javert, who am I of Jean Valjean, um, uh, and then of course Fantine and Cosette and Eponine. So we'll have all the characters covered and I have lots of little French flags for people to wave and we'll start with the Marseillaise. So that's what I was, I was walking around. I'm completely, completely like drenched in exuberance and sweat, just running around printing out my programs and also collecting all of my French flags, French revolutionary cockades. And um, of course my um, enormous uh, reproduction of the liberty leading the people. And right now I have this guy staring at me. It's my bust of Victor Hugo. And he he's staring at me. And um, and um, I, I will keep looking at him and saying, how am I doing? I, am, I, am I okay, Victor? All right. And, and of course, this guy on my lap. <laughs> every, every, every time, every time Watson... Watson knows the sounds of a Zoom coming up. He's like, okay, this is this is my 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 turn to be an international superstar. So why the miserable this year? Well, um, when it was 150 in 2012, uh, we were just a bit busy celebrating Tolstoy. I really felt that the War of 1812 was such a pivotal moment in world history. It was really like World War One because it was fought pretty much on every continent and. Um, um, and um, we, we did a lot with War and Peace. And what actually prepared me to teach French literature, since I'm not a French literature expert, was my connection with um, Tolstoy. Those of you who read War and Peace with me, um, it is the most French of all Russian novels. <laughs> and I keep telling people that if you want the most beautiful, the most poetic evocation of French victory on the battlefield. It's the end of volume one of War and Peace. It's the Battle of Austerlitz when Napoleon is at the apotheosis of his military glory. Um, and Tolstoy has a reason uh, why, he, uh, why he creates this apotheosis of Napoleon at the end of volume one, because he destroys him completely and thoroughly. He takes the great man of history and tramples him into Russian mud. Um, 
to volumes three and volumes four of War and Peace. Um, and why does um, why does Tolstoy have such a um, a passionate zeal for writing uh, splendid historical novels with multiple characters that, whose lives evolve over uh, a, a period of time? Well, it's because he read Le Miserable. So Le Miserable was published in 1862. Tolstoy was married that year. His personal life finally stabilized long enough for him to sequester himself for six years to write the greatest Russian epic ever written. And the novel was published in um, 1869. So Tolstoy's War and Peace is a direct response to um, Hugo's Le Miserable. And why does Hugo write Le Miserable? <laughs> well, many, many reasons. He starts sort of thinking about characters who are um, on the on the edge of society throughout his writing career. So Victor Hugo was born in um, 1802, um, same year as Alexander Dumas, and that's not uh, the end of their connections. Both Alexander Dumas, and I see many faces who, um, who read um, The Count of Monte Cristo with me, um, the similarities between the novels are stunning and the similarities between the authors are stunning. Both Alexander Dumas and Victor Hugo were the sons of Napoleonic generals, which is amazing. So Thomas Alexander Dumas, um, the, the father of um, Dumas the novelist, uh, was a Napoleonic general who fought uh, through all of the revolutionary wars before Napoleon came to power. And then he departed for um, Egypt. Oh, no. <laughs> and um, he was with Napoleon when the French troops took Malta. And then he was with Napoleon in Egypt. Um, Victor Hugo's father, General um, Hugo, or the French would say Hugo, uh, was uh, attached to Napoleon's brother, Joseph. And so he was the one, um, Napoleon took down the Bourbon monarchs of Spain and put his brother on the throne of Spain. And that's why Victor Hugo's father was stationed in Spain for a stretch of time. And some of Victor Hugo's childhood was spent in Spain. So those of you who will be reading, um, and I think we already had references, several references to the War of um, 1823, the French intervention in Spain. Um, Victor Hugo knows so much about it because he knows what the interest of France was in keeping Spain in the, um, um, in the French sphere of influence, both uh, before the revolution of 1789 during the Napoleonic time period and after the fall of Napoleon and of course uh, the taking down of his brother from the throne of Spain. Um, later on in the novel we'll encounter a new character. We haven't met all the characters of Le Miserable yet and he will be a very passionate young man who will be all of a sudden rediscovering um, the Napoleonic heritage of his father. Um, that young man will be a reflection of Victor Hugo, who will be raised in a um, very um, royalist um, environment. It's amazing that this, this revolutionary French author has a royalist mother who married a Republican revolutionary Bonapartist general. And uh, that will be also uh, reflected in this character who we will meet in volume three of, uh, of Le Miserable. Um, so Victor Hugo um, starts as a poet, <laughs> which is remarkable, and I have tomes and tomes of his poetry, which are already in my suitcase that are going to Riverside Theater because um, I want to display them uh, before our production of Le Mis in Concert. Um, he was a masterful poet who defined the essence of romantic poetry in France. Um, in the 1820s, um, 1830s. And he is going to be an explosive. I would say, I, I started using the word Titanic to describe Victor Hugo because there's no other way to, to describe him. He is an explosion that keeps exploding and will be exploding for centuries to come. Um, he continues, I mean, he is prolific as a poet. He, he will continue writing poetry into his 70s and, um, and he died when he was 83 years old in 1885. So he is a, a stunningly successful romantic poet, but he's also a stunningly successful playwright. And so Victor Hugo's sort of ascent to writing Le Miserable, the novel that he's known for, goes through many stages of him being successful at everything he does. Uh, one of the most important plays that he writes is um, um, Ernani, which was performed in 1830. <clears throat> 
important year in French culture when uh, we have the July Revolution of 1830, the Bourbon um, descent from power, the Orléans branch ascends to power, Louis Philippe becomes the king. And I love to talk about Louis Philippe because he is, uh, he is this character who, uh, uh, or this, um, this um, um, character of history, this, this citizen king who comes to power with a revolution in 1830 and leaves power with a revolution in 1848. Great way to rule France from revolution to revolution. Um, and 1830 becomes this explosive year where Victor Hugo's Ernani is performed and there are fist fights in the audience because Victor Hugo changes the rules of the game for how to write French drama. Um, uh, Berlioz performs his Symphonie Fantastique and there are fist fights in the audience because Berlioz changes the way music is perceived. Um, and then of course, um, the painting that we're using for the main image for this tutorial, um, A Liberty Leading the People by, um, by Delacroix is painting that here as well. And those of us who read um, The Red and the Black together, that is the year when Stendhal's the Red, and the, uh, the Red and the Black is published. So Victor Hugo is a part of this like revolutionary team of people who are leading Fra France's intellectual ferment into, onto the barricades and into the 19th century. Um, and um, um, as I mentioned in um, some of my comments, um, Thank you, Lyric Opera of Chicago, because uh, in September they performed um, Ernani of Victor, Hugo, uh, of Victor Hugo turned into an opera by Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi actually based two of his operas on, um, on uh, Hugo plays. One is um, Rigoletto, which is uh, based on the Hugo, <laughs> Hugo play. Um, the king amuses himself, and actually, yeah, Anna, I just I just saw Rigoletto last night here at the Dallas oh, Opera. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's everywhere. I actually yeah. saw Rigoletto this summer uh, at La Scala, and oh. <laughs> the um, it, it was it it was just tremendous. And I actually bought the cheapest tickets possible. I sat in the gallery, and it was so fun to see with people who come to see this opera because they love this opera so much. They are not tourists who pay way too much money for front row seats. They are the <laughs> core Italians who are ready to sing along with the chorus. So it was tremendous. So those two Verdi operas, um, Rigoletto and uh, Ernani are based on Victor Hugo plays. Um, and of course, Victor Hugo is um, a powerful force in French politics as well. So poet, playwright, and uh, his novel, um, um, Notre Dame de Paris, which is erroneously translated as the Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, because the main character of the novel is not Quasimodo. The main character of the novel is the cathedral and cathedral life in France. And do you see how we see that reflected in um, Hugo's very intricate, very, very caring description, very honest description of convent life in volume two? Victor Hugo already touched upon the subject of the essence of um, of um, religious institution in the lives of a nation in his, um, in his Notre Dame de Paris. So Victor Hugo does not participate in the revolution of 1830 in any way, shape or form. He has a baby on, on um, his way. Um, Adele, his wife is expecting a child and he has a novel deadline. So he is chained to the desk and um, Notre Dame de Paris is going to be published in 1831. So the, the success and and a turmoil of performing um, Ernani in 1830 and then Notre Dame de Paris in 1831. And Victor Hugo's life was um, with, under, under the, the, the leadership of, um, of um, uh, Louis Philippe, the, the Orléans king of uh, France, is very successful. During those years, he becomes a peer of France. Um, Louis Philippe elevates him to peerage, which means that Victor Hugo is uh, seated, seated in the Chamber of Peers in France. So he becomes a very successful politician. And also he is elected into the French Academy and that's a lifetime appointment. So all of these accolades, all of these glories that de de descend on Victor Hugo in the 1840s. Um, and, um, and then he, um, then comes the revolution of 1848. And Victor Hugo is sent by the French government to take down one of the barricades. He is the representative of the government of France fighting not on the revolutionary side, but fighting 
on the government side at one of the barricades in 1848. And he basically takes charge of the government's effort to take down this barricade because he felt that the uprising of 1848 is against the essence of France. He was defending France against um, rebel. As you are continuing reading this novel, um, just as we had this stunning asides on the nature, nature of the convent and on the nature of uh, the aftermath of the war uh, of the of the Battle of Waterloo, we are going to have um, amazing, deeply philosophical um, interjections by Victor Hugo on the nature of uprisings and revolutions. And and you can tell that Victor Hugo is still processing what it meant for him to fight against an uprising on the, uh, on the barricades of 1848. And then a stunning thing happened. Um, um, so Victor Hugo is born in a republic, right? It's 1802, France is still a republic. Then he lives through an empire, the first empire after Napoleon, uh, under Napoleon I. That empire ends um, with, um, with the first abdication of Napoleon at Fontainebleau and then his exile to Elba. And those of us who read The Count of Monte Cristo, we know how important that exile to Elba will be for the development of the plot of that novel. Then we have the 100 days of Napoleon's return and a second restoration of the Bourbon um, after the Battle of Waterloo. The novel starts in 1815, precisely because that is such a pivotal year in French history. Amazingly, The Count of Monte Cristo also starts in 1815 because it is such a pivotal year in French history. France stops being Napoleonic. And so um, Victor Hugo lives through the entirety of the Bourbon Restoration with Louis XVIII and Charles X. Well, all that ends in 1830. There will be no more Bourbon kings on the French throne after that. And then he lives through the entirety of this um, relatively peaceful and prosperous and very successful for him personally period of Louis Philippe, the citizen king. Um, as we are reading the novel, there will be a very long essay on Louis Philippe, who um, loves his family almost more than he loves friends. And the man who walks around the streets of Paris with an umbrella. <laughs> He's the umbrella king. So watch out for a long essay on Louis Philippe. And now you understand why that essay is so important for Victor Hugo. And that is why, partly, why Victor Hugo describes a minor uprising of 1832 in his barricade scenes instead of the revolution of 1830, because the revolution of 1830 brings Louis Philippe to the throne. And Victor Hugo has a very, very positive um, attitude towards this king. So he has no reason to strike against Louis Philippe in his novel. Do you see how politics is such a huge part of this novel? And that explains why 1830 is not the revolution that is described in the novel, but a minor uprising in June of 1832. And so then we, um, um, after you know, a restoration of the Bourbon and the Orléans or July monarchy of Louis Philippe uh, in 1848, um, France becomes a republic again. <laughs> and, and guess what? Uh, Victor Hugo is in government again. He is um, in, in, on, in this government that, that is sort of like a constitutional convention government. And they elect a president, and that president is <gasps> the revenge of Josephine <laughs> against Napoleon the First. Do you remember? I keep talking about this this revenge baby of Josephine. Um, her daughter from her first marriage, Hortense, married the younger brother of Napoleon to produce an heir to Napoleon. But those little heirs, those Napoleon the Seconds, kept dying. And so finally, the third baby that she had was her husband lived. And when Napoleon II, uh, Napoleon's baby was his second wife, Marie Louise of Austria, um, he died at the age of 21. Uh, he never ruled France. Um, but then this baby, the, 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 the grandson of Josephine lived. And he came back to France and he was kind of, you know, testing the political atmosphere of France. And he muscled himself into power after the revolution of 1848. And he became president and Victor Hugo was like, oh, well, you know, here's another Napoleon getting a little too close to power. And then 1851 happened um, because constitutionally this Napoleon, the president could not get reelected again. He went through a government coup, completely bloodless and he got himself appointed 
Emperor Napoleon III of the Second French Empire. So Josephine strikes again. She was divorced because she couldn't, couldn't give Napoleon I a son, but through her daughter, she became the grandmother of Napoleon III. What was what was the point of that very complicated divorce? And remember, I even I even posted a, a painting that was painted of Josephine's divorce uh, from from Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, I, I, I love those comments from the readers. Wow, there are wedding picture wedding paintings, but there are also divorce paintings. <laughs> what next? So yes, so Napoleon III comes to power, and Victor Hugo is incensed, and thus begins an eighteen year fight against this usurpation of power by Napoleon III that uh, Victor Hugo cannot accept. Thus, when, uh, when the Corbeau tenement is described in the novel, the number of the house is going to be 50 to 52, and 51 is never mentioned in this novel. So uh, Victor Hugo actually writes an entire three-page description of why it is so important that this house is 50-52, and he never mentions the fact that 51 is the unmentionable year. And um, I posted the picture of um, Juliette, his mistress, and this is when that woman uh, does something amazing. She has to hide Victor Hugo because there's a warrant for his arrest, because he writes a book that infuriates, a pamphlet that infuriates Napoleon III. The title of the pamphlet is Napoleon le Petit. Napoleon the Little, where he compares Napoleon the Third to Napoleon the First very unfavorably. Do you remember when we introduced to the Bishop of Dean? Uh, he meets Napoleon and he says to Napoleon, You are a great man, and I am a bon homme. You know, I'm I'm a humble man, and you are a great man. That is a reverberation of Victor Hugo's battle against Napoleon the Third. Because the Bishop of Dean, he doesn't say, um, you know, someone is a, a little person, but that is where Victor Hugo inserts himself into that comment. Remember, based on that comment, uh, Napoleon I loves that comment so much that he makes him, he's a priest, right? And he makes him into a bishop, right? So this, this very humble person who, uh, who was um, not destined to, be, to become a bishop, he becomes the Bishop of Dean based on that statement. That is Victor Hugo speaking to the Bishop of Dean right there, saying, you are a great man. And that is a re reverberation of the title of his, uh, of his pamphlet. The pamphlet, of course, was published outside of France, and it was distributed in France illegally, but it, it struck a chord. So many people who opposed this usurpation of power by Napoleon III, were, uh, there were warrants for their arrest. And Juliette Drouet, um, the mistress that uh, Victor Hugo kept for 50 years, they become lovers in, um, in 1833, and she dies in 1883. So she she stays with him for 50 years. When the family travels, Julia travels with him, and he gets a place for her right next to the family home. And um, I'm about to say this in my comment for um, for tomorrow. Julia Drouet was raised in a convent. That's why Victor Hugo knows such intricate details about girls being raised in convent schools. He asked her to write very, very detailed description of her childhood as a young girl who was raised in a convent school. So Juliette Drouet was an integral part of Victor Hugo writing this novel. She was his copyist, she was his muse, he traveled with her extensively. It's amazing this relationship uh, was, uh, was truly astonishing. Where is that film? Could we please have a film dedicated um, the eternal Juliet? <laughs> and then she literally was an eternal muse. She hides him from the police in 1851. She, uh, she, she manages to find a passport for him uh, with which he can leave France and he will not return to France for 18 long, long years because he will be in opposition to this monster, to this usurper, <laughs> to, uh, to Napoleon III. And, uh, and she will go into exile with him. She will, um, she will share his exile with him. Um, I'm going to post photographs of the place where Victor Hugo spent his exile, and you will be saying, oh my goodness, could I please have some of that exile too? Because he will uh, live in spectacular splendor <laughs> that I will, I will tell, uh, tell uh, the readers about it um, during, during one of my posts. 
And so 50s continue, and Victor Hugo feels that uh, perhaps, and Napoleon III is younger than Victor Hugo, and he, Victor Hugo publishes um, more collections of poetry. He's still prolific in his exile, but he starts feeling that perhaps this Napoleon III business is for good. And how am I, Victor Hugo, going to survive being separated from the language, the nation, and the city that I adore? I mean, Victor Hugo could have basically said, I am France. Napoleon III is not France. Do you remember all of those passages that Victor Hugo um, has where he describes Paris? And at one point he says, the author of this book has been separated from um, the city he loves for a long time. And the, and the, and the Paris that uh, the author describes no longer exists. That is a statement of an exile. And so it becomes the book of um, political significance. It is a very political novel for that reason. And uh, Victor Hugo puts himself into good company. Remember that Dante Alighieri was exiled from his beloved Florence for political reasons. His party lost and he was a dead man walking. And so he, um, he moves to Ravenna and um, uh, the Divine Comedy is a book of an exile. Um, very similar to um, um, Milton's Paradise Lost. He didn't have to go into exile. He was allowed to live out his life. But it is astonishing that um, Milton survived being the foreign secretary of Oliver Cromwell, and he was not executed at the end of, uh, of the Cromwell regime. He had very, very powerful polit political friends who protected him. So, yes, so... Um, in that sense, Le Miserable stands in the same category as stunning books like Paradise Lost and, um, and the Divine Comedy. And Victor Hugo mentions them. Do you remember when, um, when Jean Valjean has this incredible complex turmoil in his mind, the mind of a person who has to decide between revealing the truth, which will destroy him, and, um, and keeping was the status quo, which would preserve him. Victor Hugo mentions Milton and Dante. And he mentions Milton and Dante because those are his role models. He is he's a political writer who is writing from the point of view of opposition. And for Victor Hugo to reveal the truth is devastating for him personally. For him to have stayed with the status quo would have been very gratifying personally. Victor Hugo is Jean Valjean. And it's, it's fascinating, the name of this character, he goes, I mean, he's, he's a tree pruner from Faberol, and he keeps saying when he when, when he's being chained um, to go um, with, with the chain gang to Toulon, he keeps saying, I'm a simple tree farmer, a tree, tree pruner from Faberol. And um, he, he, he refers to his father, and how did he get this um, uh, very, very, darling name, Jean Valjean, it just rolls off your tongue. Well, his father was referred to as like, Jean, here comes Jean. Jean, voila Jean, right? Voila Jean. And so voila Jean becomes voila Jean and becomes Valjean. So Victor Hugo creates a character who is the French everyman. He is the suffering of France in the 19th century because Jean is the most common uh, French name like Ivan in Russian or John in English. So this character, Jean Valjean, is an extension of Victor Hugo, who lives the truth, despite the fact that it is destroying him personally. And he, Jean Valjean is also the character who is the, the embodiment of France in the 19th century. France that goes through all of these trials and tribulations, through all of this turmoil, and France that... Um, needs to come to terms with what it means to be um, a country that has a <laughs> that is charting a very complicated, very, very um, difficult to fathom destiny in, um, in this 19th century that keeps defying it and punching it in the gut. Thus, the Waterloo meditation. The Waterloo meditation um, cannot be skipped, cannot be avoided. And, and most uh, abridged versions of, uh, of the Miserable to skip completely the essay on Waterloo. And without that essay, this book is incomplete, um, ideologically, politically, intellectually, philosophically, theologically, because that defeat of France and the rest of French history in the 19th century is the defiance of the, uh, of the spirit of France against the background of that catastrophe. So 
Victor Hugo realizes um, it's, you know, 80, I'm sorry, 56, 57, 58, and Napoleon III is still on the throne of France, and he is younger than Victor Hugo. And Victor Hugo is starting to feel that perhaps this is for good. And so his writing of Le Miserable is a strike against the political regime of Napoleon III. And um, when I visited uh, Victor Hugo's um, birthplace at um, Besançon, and remember, I went to Besançon, those of you who know my complete affection for Julien Sorel, um, uh, who's just pretty much my favorite French character. He has been since I was 16 years old, and I'm still in love with him. He is, he is just unbearable. That's why I love him so. Um, he visits Besançon, and he goes to the Besançon Citadel, and so I just needed to see at some point in my life the Besançon Citadel. And as I was planning that trip, I started looking at the map of Besançon, looking, looking for places to visit. And I realized, oh my goodness, it's the birthplace of Victor Hugo. So it's like, yes, I have to do both. And I went to the, to the birthplace of Victor Hugo and, um, you know, I speak English and I had a dog with me. And um, um, the associates of the museum like, oh, okay <laughs> so and then and then they said do you need um do you need um you know any, any kind of information i said oh no no i know everything about victor hugo he fought napoleon the third and they immediately changed their attitude towards me it's like this woman knows the most essential thing about victor hugo and and they said you know and you know that your dog is so cute and he's obviously a, a hugo expert right <laughs> because he has been to the hugo apartment in uh, maison um, of victor hugo in paris and um it, it was amazing to see to what extent that birthplace museum in Besançon was dedicated to all of these dates. And I posted photographs and it's fascinating how you are sending the stairs to the room where he was born by stepping on steps that have the inscription of the novels, like the ascend to Le Miserable. And then the later novel that he writes about um, the very, very harsh life of um, fishermen um, in the, you know, on the Channel Islands, the, the novel is called Toilers of the Sea in English translation. So you ascend from, um, from Hernani and, um, and, um, Notre Dame de Paris to the glory of Le Miserable, but then on the wall, there are stages of Victor Hugo's development as a writer and the dates at 1830, 1848, 1851, 1852. And, um, and on and on till 1870, where he finally comes back to Paris. And he comes back to Paris only when Napoleon III has been captured by Prussian troops during the war that just birthed the, um, the, the German Empire, the Franco-Prussian War. And Victor Hugo returns to Paris in triumph under the bombardment of the Prussian troops, and he lives through the blockade of Paris in 1830 while the Prussian troops are bombarding Paris because bombard, uh, Paris will, will go through a horrific siege at the end of that war. And then, of course, the next revolution, and that revolution uh, is the um, 1871 revolution. So Victor Hugo's life is connected to all four French revolutions. He did not live, obviously, in 1789, but that revolution informs the Bishop of Dean. It informs the life of Jean Valjean, and Jean Valjean commits his crime, right? He is sent uh, to penal servitude for stealing bread in 18, um, sorry, in 1796, um, right? Well, just imagine the horror of those years. Hungry, miserable years, starvation, poverty, war. Um, uh, coalition attacks against revolutionary France because the same powers that will drown France in blood in 1815, that um, the, the, the war, uh, the Battle of Waterloo is the final war of a revolutionary war period where the monarchist powers of Europe would combine their powers to strike at France. And that is uh, the, the Battle of Waterloo is um, the, uh, at the end of the seventh coalition war against France. So in the 1790s, we have the first coalition wars and the second coalition wars uh, where European monarchs combine forces to strike at France over and over and over again. So um, starvation, malnutrition, abandoned children, um, families dying, um, children and women being abandoned because there are so many missing men at this point in France. 
that is the essence of what was happening in the 1790s in the aftermath of the French Revolution. So it's not just the revolution itself. 1789 was a bad, 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 bad thing for many people for many, many reasons. And France is depopulated of, um, of its, um, its ruling elite. Um, and um, they have to invent everything from scratch. Um, I mean, they announced everything from scratch to the point where they redesigned the calendar. They they renamed the months of the year. The the, the I think seven, 1792 becomes year zero of the French Republic. So everything is in turmoil, and um, and that starvation that necessitates the theft of um, of the bread by Jean Valjean is the aftermath of this catastrophic change in um, in French life and French history and also the aftermath of the coalition wars of European monarchies against France in the 1790s. Um, so Victor Hugo feels that he will strike at Napoleon III by writing the novel that will seal his, his destiny. And that's why this novel is so massively, massively philosophical and so massively uh, grounded in history. Victor Hugo is writing the narrative of France in the face of um, totalitarian usurpation of power by um, by Napoleon III. Sorry, I keep, um, I'm, I'm in charge of the Zoom because everyone, everyone at the City of Literature in Iowa City is at the book festival. So I have to um, admit people as they are joining our Zoom. Um, so that is a bit of history and um, here, keep admitting people. That is a bit of history. So this is, this is my, my, um, 30 minute soliloquy um, grounded um, the novel in the context of the 19th century. So revolution of 1789, which Victor Hugo did not witness, but also um, the subsequent revolutions, um, the revolution of 1830 that is reflected in the plot of Le Miserable. And then um, the revolution of 1848 will be actually described um, later on in the novel, even though the novel ends at about, what, 1833, 34, 35, right? The revolution of 1848 will be mentioned by Victor Hugo. He will bring it into the novel precisely because it is so important for him personally. And it's so important for the understanding of his vision of France. And um, and the the novel will be published in 1862. I mean, it's, um, it's uh, 160 this year. Um, but um, the, eight, uh, the 1871 revolution, of course, is not going to be a part of this, but Victor Hugo leads us to a better understanding of the revolution of 1871 through all of his discussion of um, the nature of, um, of France's place in European history and in world history throughout the novel. Um, and it's fascinating how he keeps saying things like um, the revolution of 1830, the seeds of the revolution of 1830, were already planted in the Bourbon intervention in Spain in 1823. And then he gives us an explanation why that intervention in Spain, which suppressed um, an independence movement in Spain, will eventually rever reverberate in France, where that independence, suppressed independence movement will uh, bleed into French political life of the late 1820s. Very, very historical novel, <laughs> very French novel. Victor Hugo, here, here he is staring at me. How am I doing, Victor? There he is. Um, Victor Hugo is um, is definitely giving me a run <laughs> through, through all of these very, very, very complex um, um, historical, theological, philosophical um, uh, points of... Um, of um, France's placement in, in European and world history in the 19th century, um, which is fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said that on the, um, on the Count of Monte Cristo Zoom, a note to self, do not move from one 1,300-page novel to another 1,300-page novel without giving yourself a break. But um, this, is, uh, this is fascinating. And, and also on that Zoom, I mentioned that um, there are so many similarities between the novels. And um, those of you who did not read The Count of Monte Cristo, I strongly recommend you do. It's a super fun summer read. Wait, wait till next summer. It's, it's fantastic. It's just a page turner. Um, but there are so many similarities and I'm going to highlight these similarities without naming the character. Uh, both characters are imprisoned and spend a very long period of time in jail. 
both characters are known by their number. And, um, and the, there's this sense of the inf effacement of um, the character's identity, the, the destruction of the character's humanity um, through this numbering of a character. Um, and of course, Jean Valjean goes through this numbering twice um, when he is um, sent to, the, um, to work um, on a chain gang in Toulon the second time he gets a new number. Um, and then um, both characters um, go through a moment of resurrection, and I shall say no more. And um, both characters are known under false names. And so we meet Jean Valjean as this person who cannot um, be admitted into any inn um, in uh, Montreux-sur-Mer because he has a passport of a convict. Um, and before we meet this character who has the passport of a convict, um, we are given a very long digression into the life of the Bishop of Dean. And the most essential um, volume one conversation that we have is the conversation between uh, the Bishop of Dean and, um, um, sorry, Montreux mayor is later when he, when he becomes a mayor. He's still in Dean. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just getting a little ahead of myself. So he's in Dean and he cannot be admitted into any inn because he's a convict. Um, and so uh, the Bishop of Dean has a conversation with a dying member of the convention. And um, that, that conversation, if you get a chance before we move on with the novel to reread those chapters one more time, that would be extremely helpful because that conversation informs the rest of the novel. Later on in the novel, we are going to have families that are torn apart um, horrifically because of political disagreements. And Victor Hugo gives us the sort of the blueprint of how political disagreements can be resolved. But at the same time, Victor Hugo cannot resolve his political disagreement with Napoleon III. And so Victor Hugo, I, that's why um, I said many, many times, if you have any kind of political, ideological, philosophical, or theological convictions, Victor Hugo will challenge them. He will not tell you that you are wrong, but he will tell you that all, point of view, all points of view are valid in a truly um, multi-point of view discussion. And uh, when the Bishop of Dean allows the, um, the, the member of the convention and they sentence Louis the uh, 16th to death and, uh, and Bishop of Dean is a royalist, he can't even ex accept Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, the Bishop of Dean is upset with his brother who is a general who um, is following, who followed Napoleon from the, the south of France after his landing um, uh, from, from the island of Elba, uh, who followed him from the south of France to Paris as if he was not really um, interested in capturing the usurper, right? So that is the disagreement that the Bishop of Dean has with his brother, uh, a general. And so the Bishop of Dean says, but what about the young prince? And uh, that was the Dauphin of France, right? The young man, the young boy, who died in jail and he was given the honorary title of Louis the 17th and um and the member of the convention says but what about all of the children of the protestants who were tortured by the bourbon regime and he is allowed to speak his mind he's a dying man who speaks his mind and then he looks at the bishop of dean and says why did you come here and the bishop of dean says to get your blessing and that is the moment that we must remember for the rest of the novel because the Bishop of Dean understands that, um, oh, human beings are complicated. And uh, when this well, it's very, very complicated man knocks on his door and um, um, Jean Valjean basically vomits information when he enters uh, the house of the Bishop of Dean. He is being beyond honest. <laughs> he, he, he says so much, so fast, and he is standing at the door. And note, it happens so fast that they realize that they are forgetting to close the door. And it's late, late fall in, um, in France. It gets cold in France. And the door is still open. I mean, they remember to like, close the door later on. It's as if this spirit of truth marches into that space, um, to that humble dwelling of the bishop who gave up his bishop's palace to be the hospital. And he's living in this very humble dwelling with his saintly sister and his, um, and his saintly housekeeper who make do with so little. And Jean Valjean is, is regurgitating 
everything that is in his soul. I'm a convict. I stole. I, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not the kind of person that you want in your house. And the Bishop of Dean gives him space at his table. And of course, you know, the stealing of the, uh, of the silver is the pivotal moment in that novel. Jean Valjean is brought back. The moment when Jean Valjean is actually contemplating stealing, the, the deeply philosophical, um, it, um, it's, um, it's a thrilling, thrilling monologue that is happening in the sight of Jean Valjean. We can see the reasoning for a crime to come into existence. Um, you will see that um, resurface in the internal monologues of Raskolnikov in, um, in Dostoevsky's um, Crime and Punishment, right? And so um, it's, it's amazing to what extent we see the crime being perpetuated mentally. And then Jean Valjean is looking at the sleeping Bishop of Dean and he looks so peaceful. It is a terrifying moment. We really do not want to ever be observed by, by people who are having deeply devious thoughts while we are in sleep. But there is this peacefulness about the Bishop of Dean. And Jean Valjean violates that peacefulness. He's, he still goes, goes ahead with this crime and he runs off and he's brought back. And the Bishop of Dean gives him the silver candle holders and he says, I am buying your soul with these candle holders. And he is undoing the betrayal of Judas because Judas sold innocence for silver and he's purchasing innocence for silver. And so he's giving these candle, candle holders to Jean Valjean and he's saying, you are going to be a good man. And then Jean Valjean is rushing through this barren landscape, uh, inhospitable landscape. And he has this tumultuous, um, storm in his mind because he's saying, I do not want to be the chosen one. Do you see how often um, Victor Hugo is actually placing Jean Valjean into the position of Christ? Because he actually says, you know, 1800 years ago, there was an innocent man who was given the option <laughs> of taking on a mantle that he did not want to bear. And, and, and Jean Valjean is basically during that soliloquy saying, take this cup away from me. I do not want it. I don't want to be good. I don't want, I don't want people to have expectations of my goodness. It's too much to bear. We are human. We want to be selfish. We want to be enraged. We want to be awful. We want to be, we want to be human. We do not want people to have expectations of our goodness. It's a huge cross to bear and it's too much. Thus, his like perverse stepping on that little coin of uh, Petit Gervais, the little chimney sweep, the Savoyard. Um, and that is the moment he betrays innocence at that point, right? And that is the moment where he pauses and he chases down this priest and he starts screaming at him, I am Jean Valjean, I stole this coin. And the priest just runs away from him. It, it is the same moment, those of you who read, oh, you didn't read Crime and Punishment with me, we'll have to read Crime and Punishment. There's a moment when what can, uh, the, one of the characters in Crime and Punishment will have to come clean. And um, and he's all of a sudden like coming clean and people around him and and, um, and Dostoevsky withdraws and people around him have this conversation and they are saying, oh, that one is plastered, he's drunk. I mean, there's the sense when we are telling the truth, we are just insane to the point of drunken delirium because Saying the truth is awful. We are we are exposing ourselves, and and Jean Valjean exposes himself so much during that uh, that that uh, conversation with the priest, and then all of a sudden we see a man resurface, and he's good, and he is virtuous, and he is helping this town mm, find economic footing, and um, I keep saying that um, the miserable was um, was um, denounced by everyone <laughs> when it was published. Um, atheists denounced it because there is such positive betray, uh, positive portrayal of uh, figures of the church, both um, uh, the sisters, you know, the, the, the sister uh, who, Sister Simplice, who um, lies twice at the end of volume one. You know, the woman who never lied in her life all of a sudden starts lying right and left for a cause. Um, and I, I told the readers that that reminds me of those nuns at the end of The Sound of Music. Remember, they disable the car and they're like, oops. <laughs> so, yes, 
um, since Sister Simplice is the um, is the literary precedent for the nuns in the Sound of Music. So the the atheist denounced it because it's such a Catholic, such a religious book. Uh, but of course, the Church denounced it. I mean, the Vatican put it on the naughty book list because it's about prostitutes, and then um, uh, conservatives denounced it because it's a book about positive portrayal of revolutionaries. Uh, but of course, liberals denounced it too, because it's a book about the benefits of capitalism and enterprise. <laughs> so um, I, everyone, everyone was upset with Le Miserable. And, and I keep saying that uh, Victor Hugo must have gotten everything right, <laughs> because he enraged everyone when he published this book. And we have that glorious portrayal of Fantine. She is the golden girl. She is the golden girl with the golden hair. And hers was the innocence that survives transgression. It is such a beautiful line. She still has that innocence clinging to her. And of course, that innocence is very rapidly destroyed. But uh, Victor Hugo does tell us that Fantine, when she had a job, um, she was... She was content, she was proud, she was happy because doing a work that you love and living um, through your own effort is such a tremendous boost to a human being. So yes, capitalism, yes, entrepreneurship. And, um, and Victor Hugo was denounced for this um, by, by the liberals who were, um, who were especially you know, socialists who were supporting the proletariat. But Victor Hugo is showing the life of successful, successful numbers of the proletariat. And of course, um, um, do you remember when Bishop Dean, um, this is a wonderful line in, in volume one, Bishop Dean put no virtue outside of human beings reach. What he expected of people was within their reach until Jean Valjean. He asked, of Jean Valjean to become a saint. And Jean Valjean asked virtue of his workers. Of course, men worked with men, women worked with women, so as not to distract each other <laughs> during the production of jet jewelry. <laughs> and so um, Fantine was dismissed because according to the supervisor of the women's workshop, her virtue did not correspond to the aspirations of the establishment. And this was... Jean Valjean inadvertently felt that he placed virtue outside of reach of this woman. And um, the kind of expectation that he had of this woman was outside her reach. And she had such a terrific conflict of interest that um, it brought her downfall. The, the scene was um, Père Madeleine coming between Javert and Fantine. I could read that over and over and over again. And I would be, it's like hanging off a cliff and, and knowing full well that you're about to fall. You cannot breathe. It, it is impossible. Like you, you, will, you will read that passage and then you realize, oh, I forgot to breathe for the last 20 minutes. It's just you, instead of going, oh, you just go, what next? And, um, and Javert is speechless and a, a prostitute spits in the face of a mayor and the mayor says, let her go. And the ideological aspect of that battle is stupendous because um, Javier says, this is the law. And Jean Valjean says, but this is the biblical law. And Javier says, but this is the law of right now. And right now is, um, let's see. Yes, Bourbon restoration, okay. And Jean Valjean quotes a passage from 1790s, from the time when France is the first republic. So French Republican law beats monarchist law, biblical law beats human law. And it is just a, a protean battle between two titans and the rocks they hurl at each other are very, very political. So just knowing what each of them stands for and knowing the background of the political background of that conversation is essential for understanding what happens. And Jean Valjean is flabbergasted. Oh, sorry, sorry, Javert is flabbergasted. And then the best part is Javert's position is appointed. Jean Valjean's position is elected. Elected authority trumps appointed authority. 
absolutely stunning. So that conversation of two angels and, and um, Fantine is looking at the two of them and she's saying there are two angels fight, fighting for my soul. And she, she knows full well that there's an angel of darkness, Shaver, and an, another angel of darkness, <laughs> Jean Valjean. She, she thinks that uh, Père Madeleine, that's why she spits at him, is the cause of her, of her downfall from grace. It, she's right, inadvertently, Pierre Madeleine is the reason for her downfall. But there are these two angels of darkness fighting for her soul. And then she realizes that out of that fight of two angels, one of them emerges as the angel of light. And it is very theological, it's very philosophical, but it is also ideological and historical. And um, so that fight is won by, um, by Jean Valjean, and of course, then... Javert strikes him and he says, oh, by the way, uh, I was wrong. Fire me. Please fire me. <laughs> I wanted to denounce you. I thought you were a criminal, but guess what? This criminal showed up. And then the internal monologue of Jean Valjean at that point is staggering. I mean, once again, that's another passage that you read completely, completely breathlessly. His, his internal monologue of, if I denounce myself, um, everything that I stood for, all the good that I brought into this world will collapse. And this is the great theological, philosophical question that Victor Hugo poses. Between saving all and saving one, which do we choose? And he, he posits the, the impossible question. And Jean Valjean is basically saying, if I save many, I lose myself in a lie. If I, if I, if I save one unworthy person, I will save myself, but lose all. And that philosophical discussion is absolutely unbearable. It is absolutely, absolutely unbearable. But that is the question that is at the essence of all of these truth-seeking narratives. When I teach Tolstoy um, and his this you know titanic battle with himself at the end of his life, um, I always um, refer to the um, last paragraph of Isaiah Berlin's um, essay on Tolstoy's a view of history in War and Peace called The Fox and the Hedgehog. And at the end of that essay, Isaiah Berlin compares Tolstoy to Oedipus. Um, and I'm going to bring back the story of Oedipus, not because of the um, whole um, Mary Mother connotations, but Oedipus eventually blinds himself with the brooch of his, um, of his wife not because he married his wife, uh, he, he married his mother and she became his wife, but because his rule, which was good for thieves, was based on a lie. And so here we go back to this Greek notion of good that comes from a lie. And that is the essence of this titanic confrontation that Jean Valjean has with himself. Do I keep this good status going, even though it's based on a lie? Or do I destroy goodness, but let, uh, let, let, let truth triumph? That is eventually the, um, the decision that Tolstoy will make at the end of his life. And um, that, Tolstoy, that Tolstoy decision at the end of his life will destroy everything around him. But will keep him was the truth. And the truth is unbearable. <laughs> Do you see how complicated Victor Hugo is? He goes all the way back to that confrontation of Oedipus with himself. Do I live with a lie that is keeping Thebes happy? Or do I reveal the truth and destroy everything around me? <laughs> and we find out was the was the um, revelation about uh, Père Madeleine, the whole town collapses. And, uh, and Victor Hugo, do you remember when he says that Javert couldn't do anything against this mayor because the, the government officials in Paris were pleased with what, happened, what was happening in montreal sur mer because the cost of collecting taxes from this town was so low, right? They didn't have to send all of these tax, uh, tax collectors and tax investigators because the town was booming to the point where the revenue was flowing in. And then Victor Hugo gives us one line that the Paris authorities were very unhappy because all of a sudden became very expensive to extract taxes from Montreux-sur-Mer. So do you see how 
Victor Hugo is even a political economist <laughs> when, when it comes to describing the complexities of how economies of the world um, function. <sighs> Destruction of the town, um, but salvation of one human life. It's the Oedipus choice. It's the Tolstoy choice. It's the Jean Valjean choice. And um, in that process, he loses um, He loses Fantine. I love the moment where he confronts Javert one more time over the body of Fantine. And um, he is a strong man. I mean, he is, he's huge. He's menacing. He's terrifying. He is the essence of the French proletariat. He is the essence of this booming, exploding France that keeps sticking its tongue out at the world over and over and over again and punching everyone in the face over and over and over again. And when um, Jean Valjean grabs, he, he like destroys one of the beds in the, in the convent infirmary and he's holding a very menacing uh, piece of um, uh, furniture that he is willing to use as a weapon. And at that point, Javert is terrified, physically terrified for his life. And Jean Valjean looks like this avenging angel. I mean, he might as well be a cherubim with a flaming sword because he is. Because what is happening at that moment, he, the cherubim with the flaming sword, is admitting a soul into afterlife. And he says to Javert, you better not interfere with this. And he means it. And Javert has to just cower in the background. He's such a little coward. And, um, and, um, Jean Valjean leans over um, Fantine, he accepts her soul into afterlife, and he promises to her that he will be the angel that will guide the steps of a child whose misery he inadvertently caused. And thus begins the rest of the novel. And of course, volume one ends with our character disappearing. He just goes like, Poo! and he's gone. And so what a fabulous, fabulous ploy for selling volume two. That's, that's what um, Dostoevsky will do at the end of volume one, volume two, volume three, volume four, volume five of Crime and Punishment, right? All of them end on a cliffhanger because you just, you just want to sell the next volume. So volume one, our character disappears and the saintly nun lies. And um, she, uh, Javier says, are you here alone, sister? Even though he sees a candle that was just like recently burned, uh, blown out. And the sister says, yes, I am. <laughs> just, just praying, just praying for the life of a great sinner in his office was, you know, the candle just burned out. And um, so, yes, I've um, monologued for an hour here. I love this novel so much. It is, it is a, um, a mountain, <laughs> it is a mountain and we are, we are carrying all of us up this mount, up to this mountaintop. And, um, and if you are wondering, um, what else can Victor Hugo offer us? This is already so much, so much politically, historically, philosophically, theologically. He is appealing to us on such a deeply human level. He's engaging our intellect, our heart, our soul. We are all in it all the way. What what else can he offer us? And it's a, it's a whirlwind all the way to the very end. And um, and I went through this novel. So I listened to all of it in August and I just finished teaching it as a five week course. What folly. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I would have these 90 minute lectures that covered like, you know, 75, 85, 95 chapters of the miserable. It was, um, I, I told my readers, it's like running through a forest and trying to touch as many trees as possible while shouting hurrah all the way. And so, um, so I've gone through the entire novel twice in the past two months. And um, at the end, I just, I sobbed. I sobbed at the end of the film. It is, the end is, unbearable, gut-wrenching. It will, it will completely undo you. So an hour into my monologue, let me, since I'm all alone, so I just wanted to uh, reiterate that I am all alone. There's no one to read questions because everyone is at the Iowa City Book Festival. <laughs> so I am, I'm headed to the book festival, right? After I'm through with this, but I just felt like if I don't do this today, then um, when, when can we do this? Because uh, we are so far into volume two at this point, we pretty much need to do a volume two. 
um, Zoom shortly. So the, the plan is to have volume two Zoom sometime later in, uh, in October. And then we will do um, volumes three and four Zooms in November, and then volume uh, five Zoom sometime after December 10th. So between December 10 and December 20. Um, and then we'll say a tearful goodbye to, um, um, to Victor Hugo. And um, many of you ask me what next. Um, of course, it's, um, it's Madame Bovary of Flaubert. Flaubert didn't like Le Miserable. <laughs> oh my gosh, Flaubert, how, how blind could you be? Such jealousy among all of these French intellectuals. And, um, and the reason why we are reading uh, Madame Bovary is um, that was the direct influence to Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which will be our big um, read next fall. Um, I am already planning book festival events for Anna Karenina. Um, and then, then, you know, Russian literature is so hard to, to bear, so hard to lift. It requires so much of you that I'm thinking, oh, and after Anna Karenina, could we just like do an entire year of Alexander Dumas? <laughs> I'm just so bonkers about Alexander Dumas. And he wrote so much and his novels are so thrilling and so much fun. And it's such a wonderful antidote to all of that Russian brooding um, that, you know, like let's do like Queen Margot and the Three Musketeers and sequel one and sequel two. And then, and then uh, just continue having fun was, uh, was, um, Victor uh, was Alexander Dumas, but then readers, are, oh, Anna, but what about like Don Quixote? And what about Goethe's Faust? And so I'm getting all of these requests. And somebody said, how about Divine Comedy? And I'm like, okay, to do Quixote, I would have to study for a year. To do um, Goethe's Faust, I would have to study for three years. To do um, the Divine Comedy, I would have to study for five years. I mean, that, that will be like how much it would require for me to to do its justice. And, um, and once again, I am happy, happily teaching French literature because of Tolstoy, you know, we have to, we have to give credit where credit is due. Um, War and Peace prepared me for all things French. Um, and I've taught War and Peace 18 times at this point. So I uh, love, 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 love that book. And um, that is the book that prepared me for all this. So let me look at your questions. Um, let's see if I can read them. Oh my goodness, so John Canyon, um, he, okay, he started the Zoom and it's still being recorded. I have a question. Bunteen visit her daughter, um, because she had no money. I mean, she absolutely has no money. And you have to understand that the, the portrayal of Bunteen is not idealized. She's not the you know, prostitute with a heart of gold. Um, she's a young woman with passions, with raging passions, and she has, she has the sense of abandonment in her life, right? Um, she was abandoned by the father of the child. She wrote letters to him, but he, um, um, after he uh, abandoned her and the baby, she, um, she descended into this self-destructive mode, right? And remember, speaking of political economy, as soon as she has a little bit of money, she makes her life pretty, right? She, she, she borrows money to put pretty things all around herself. She, she sets up a, a lovely little apartment for herself. And then when she starts losing her job, she starts giving away all of the things until she has just rags on the floor to, um, to, um, um, to sleep on. And, and then that old woman who, um, from whom, with whom she is sharing this, uh, this apartment space, she teaches her, um, Victor Hugo says, there is living on little and there is living on nothing. And so that older woman is teaching Fantine how to live on nothing. And Fantine has no money to, to go to the Thenardiers. She, she would have to walk and, um, and she has no way to provide for, for Cosette. It, it's a very, very long time. It's five years where she doesn't see her daughter. And we are questioning her ability to mother this child as readers, but um, Victor Hugo does not idealize her. And she descends into the self-destructive mode um, because she is not a wise young woman. She is, um, she is a young woman who is young, who is pretty, who is beset with passions. And so she is not a perfect character. And, um, and Jean Valjean then, of course, will intervene on her behalf. But, but that moment where he promises over her corpse to be the guardian angel of this child is terrifying for us. 
because we know that it will be impossible for him to do this, right? His promise to Fantine is just as impossible as um, the Bishop of Dean, like prodding of, um, of uh, Valjean onto, um, onto the road of righteousness. I just got another question um, that Fantine's, oh my goodness. Um, Oh my goodness, uh, somebody said that I make a lot of sense. Wow, thank you. <laughs> Just, I wonder sometimes. Okay, so uh, more Duma, more Dostoevsky. Yes, we need to we need to do all of Dostoevsky. So let's start with Poor Folk and the Devil. And uh, and uh, what else is in there? Um, the Insulted and the Injured. <laughs> and uh, all of those novels that no one reads. So notes from Underground, and then Crown and Punishment, and after that, The Idiot, and then Demons, and then Adolescent, and then Brothers Karamazov. Again, because um, I always tell students, in order to understand Brothers Karamazov, and we did it last fall, you have to read all of Dostoevsky, because that is his magnum opus. It just sort of contains everything that, um, that Dostoevsky accomplished in all of those earlier novels. Um, but after Rigoletto, how much these novels are focused on the marginalized of society? Yes, non-royalty as a lens to view all events. Yes, so the novel's title is Le Miserable, and La Misère in French is misery. And it's not necessarily that um, the novel focuses on characters who stand outside the law, and that's the essence of Javert. Remember, Javert is born to a fortune teller in jail, and his father is a convict. Javert is a gutter child. Javert is the product of prison misery. Okay. And as he's growing up with a convict father and an imprisoned mother, he realizes that there are only two types of human beings, human beings who stand within the law and human beings who stand outside the law. And he chooses to be a human being who stands inside the law instead of a human being who stands outside the law. And that defines Javert. For him, there is no such thing <laughs> as a redeemed convict. Javert's yeah, yeah. greatest problem is he cannot accept repentance and redemption. There is no. All, there. But, but everything we've been reading, I mean, uh, Chaubert and, and even even uh, uh, Monte Cristo, it's mm -hmm. there's a lot of this. You're, it's it's not well. Here's the prince, and what he does is a noble hero, and uh, you know, or something of the aristocracy being a hero. It's right. no, it's people that are lift, coming up out of the gutter, as it were, mm -hmm. that are, that are, right, you know, right, uh, of the normal walks of life. Yeah, and just think how much gutter um, personalities, how many gutter personalities we've seen in the Count of Monte Cristo. Think Cadruce. Do you see how Cadruce um, merges sort of into the Thenardier family, right? And what is also remarkable about the Thenardier family, they are the only family we've met so far and they are despicable. So do you see Victor Hugo does not idealize anything. We have only one family so far in this novel, where there's a mom and dad and kids. Um, and of course there's a boy screaming in the back room, but Madame Thenardier's mothering habits do not extend to sons. <laughs> she likes girls. The girls are beautiful. They are nicely dressed. They are very clean. They have dolls. And she she extends her, her mothering to girls, but not to boys. And um, remember, Victor Hugo tells us, please remember that boy who is screaming in the back room. <laughs> He's coming back as a character in this novel, of course. Um, Yes, so this, the, the title of the novel is um, Le Miserable, and it's translated, it's not translated, when, when, when the novel is translated into other languages, like English, the title remains. And so the, the essence of the title, I mean, Victor Hugo will ask us to understand what the, what the essence of the title is for the rest of the novel. Um, but it's not necessarily about the, the gutter class, the underclass, and we are going to uh, meet so many more of gutter characters because in the countryside, you know, the, the difference between the well-to-do and the not well-to-do is not as striking as in a place like Paris. So the discrepancy between the, the aristocracy and the well-to-do and the merchant class and the, and the bourgeoisie and the, the people who live in the gutters uh, is going to be catastrophic by the time we get to the Paris sections of this, of this novel. And, you know, we're already there. We saw the Corbeau tenement, right? It's, uh, it's misery. It's, it's misery everywhere. But Victor Hugo is asking a much broader question. He's, he is talking about all of us human beings dealing with what it means to be a human being, what, what the human condition is. 
and the human condition entails a lot of misery. Um, it's the misery of the soul. It's the misery of having to make these decisions that, that we do not want to make. <laughs> we, as I said, we don't want to be good. Being good is so hard. Being good entails sacrificing a chunk of ourselves. Being good means um, defying ourselves. And, um, and that is the essence of the character of Jean Valjean. And um, are there rewards to being good? Well, let's just keep reading. <laughs> let's keep reading. Let's, let's wait and see. Um, and I, I, let's see, there are more messages. Um, aha, a sociopath uh, would not have a crisis of conscience. Um, well, let's just keep reading. <laughs> let's just keep reading. Um, at times they can, a sociopath wouldn't, but um, a sociopath can, yes, very good, very good point. Um, let's see, I cannot, let's see, uh, uh, Jal and Jal have many traits. Um, um, not, not necessarily Jean Valjean, I feel, um, I, I, the, both, both characters of Jean Valjean and Javert are based on the same uh, historical character. I have his, um, um, his name um, written here, his name was Eugène Vidoc. He was a convict who turned into um, a policeman. <laughs> and so uh, there's historical precedent for this character. And I mentioned that there are historical precedents for so many things that happen in volume one, uh, such as when Fontaine is attacked by that no good bum who throws a snowball um, behind her collar. Uh, Victor Hugo observed a prostitute being assaulted that way in Paris and he followed the arrested prostitute to a police precinct. And he was the one, he, he was the, 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 the Jean Valjean character in that case. He was the one who got that prostitute off the hook because he explained how she was pestered by this person who threw a snowball behind her collar. Um, also um, in, his, um, in his early book, I think it was published in 18, um, 20, 1829, um, and I think the title is um, The Last Day of the Condemned Men, uh, where he talks about capital punishment. And Victor Hugo is going to fight against capital punishment all his life. Um, he describes a character who was imprisoned because he stole bread. And so the idea of like writing about the misery of the human condition um, appeals to him, appears to him even before he finishes Notre Dame de Paris, his 1831 novel. So this, this, this character of Jean Valjean is already there in his writing in the late 1820s. Um, but I'm going to uh, post um, a um, note on Eugène Vidoc as the character who inspired both Javert and Valjean. He was a criminal who then started the first um, French um, private detective agency. <laughs> so... So um, it's fascinating to uh, like trace all of these various connections that Victor Hugo has with reality. Um, let me just look at one more question. And um, um, okay, I think Hugo is trying to um, show the construction of a human who ends up becoming what he is, a person very badly treated by life. Yes, so I think this is a good place to end. Um, all of us are people who are mishandled let's just say by life. And, um, and we all have to make choices um, based on um, the, um, the cards we are dealt in life. Um, there's, all, there's the sense of the omnipotence of providence in the novel. There's this, there's this thing, the, the, the facts of life that hover above the characters. And uh, Victor Hugo is very mindful of that. Um, the, the role of providence is tremendous. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, even the role of providence is there during his description of the Battle of Waterloo, right? Because um, he's saying, um, why did the French lose? Why did, mm, did the English win? Nah, <laughs> it was just a lucky chance because God willed it so. And so Victor Hugo definitely understands the role of providence, the role of fate in human life. And um, the novel ultimately is about human choices in the face of the impossibility of coping with fate. And, um, and that's the larger project that Victor Hugo is engaged in. And it's, it's the life of one human soul who has been chosen to be good in the face of 
impossible circumstances. Oh, thank you, Anna. It's nice to see Watson too. Well, Watson is here. He is just wondering what's going on. <laughs> what, are we, what are we going to do now? So I am going to, um, unless there are any questions, and I'm not going to read any more comments because it's very hard for me to like look at you and read comments because then I have to cover your beautiful faces up with the comment section. So now I can see you again. So um, let's see, we are about an hour and 15 minutes right now, which is great. Um, if you have any questions, last minute questions, please um, ask. And otherwise I'm going to pack my bag and put all of my French flags, French cockades, uh, leaflets. <laughs> I actually ordered some parchment paper and I printed out the program. I posted the program and everything that I'm bringing with me to the concert um, on our page. And um, I, the funny thing is, so on Facebook, there's only one kind of um, font that appears. You cannot change the, the Facebook font. But I, I might take um, just a photograph of the leaflets that I'm bringing to our revolutionary meeting because I found this impossible to read French um, uh, um, uh, when you write with your hand, what, what, what is the word for it? Cursive, that's it, <laughs> French cursive font that uh, connects all the letters beautifully. And uh, I did it on purpose. I will hand out this program and everybody, and, and I printed it on beautiful, like thick, old fashioned seeming parchment paper. So, and I'm not going to staple anything because there were no staples <laughs> in 19th century France. So everybody will get a French cockade and a little French flag and we'll start the meeting by singing the Marseillaise. <laughs> so I will call that revolutionary meeting to order. And at this point, I'm calling this revolutionary uh, meeting to an end and um, more comments um, coming soon. But um, you can tell that it's so much easier for me to express everything that I'm saying in person <laughs> because I'm such a, such a in-person person. And, um, and, um, Writing is hard, but um, I will continue churning out all of those comments. So I still need to give you a comment on Victor Hugo, the politician. I still need to give you a comment on where Victor Hugo wrote Le Miserable. And um, I have to give you a comment on another mistress of Victor Hugo because he had so many. There were like literally hundreds of women, but Juliet was the one and only mistress whom he kept for 50 years, but there was another woman who was very, very, very important in the 1840s, so I'll, I'll write about her, and I need to write about this character, Eugene Bidoc, who inspired both uh, Javert and Valjean, so it's like five extra comments, and then continuing with the novel, so thank you very much, I'm going to end now, and um, run to have more fun with Victor Hugo, cheers, happy reading, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.